You're listening to Two Girls, One Crossword. Good morning, good morning. Good it's morning. It's great to stay up late, which I did last <laughs> night because I was just thinking about, you know, the world and what's happening to it. Yeah, I'm thinking about the world and what's <laughs> happening to it too. It's 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 something to think about. <laughs> yeah. And now it's yeah. early morning um, mm-hmm. and we're back. We're back. It is also, we record on Friday mornings for those who are not privy to our habits. If you're a longtime listener, you you know a lot about our habits because we, we, don't, we don't like to keep secrets. Mm-mm. But we do record on Friday mornings. So that means Chelsea's got her Friday Dunkin' Donuts. You hear that? That's the ice, baby. It's just shaking around in my iced coffee. It's, it's a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day. I'll just say that, that is that's the best way to start a day with a nice, cold, fun drink. Yes, um, just a little. I just have like my treat, you know. Yeah, I just have my water bottle. Sorry, I have my fun treats on different days. We were actually this is what we were discussing before we came on air. <laughs> um, but yeah, what's your what is do other people like give themselves one treat that they really look forward to that like gets them through the week? And do you prefer to have your week or your treat on a day that's already good, like mm-hmm. a Friday? Or uh-huh. do you prefer to do a treat on a day that otherwise kind of sucks, like a Monday, Ooh. Tuesday? Right, because I was telling Grace that uh, Matt and I do like our Dunkin' treat or our Starbucks treat on Friday because it's like a job well done. You've survived the week. Have a little something to send you into the weekend. Mm-hmm. Um, similarly, if we're going to order like food, it'll be like a Friday or a Saturday, you know, just yeah. kind of like celebrate <laughs> that, I don't know, we're alive and it's and we're not working. Mm-hmm. Um, but Grace is a little different with her her, her drink treats. Yeah, I mean, I I most I almost always get takeout on Friday, but yeah, I do like <laughs> to get a drink treat on in like a random weekday because sometimes mm-hmm. that's what you need to get you through the week. Um, but I don't want to reveal too much because I don't want people to be following my schedule. <laughs> that's true. Um, she's really not looking for a stalker right now, actually. No. And so. Look, if I was rich, I'd have a, a treat every day. I want people to know that I'm not trying to like deprive myself of sweets. It's that, you know, this thing, it adds up. Dunkin' Donuts, it's expensive. Starbucks. Yeah. yeah, it's expensive. Trust me, if I was made of money, I I wouldn't hold back. I think I deserve a treat every day for my, I hard, deprive myself my hard work. I deprive myself of nothing, basically. <laughs> Speaking of depriving ourselves <laughs> of time off, which we don't, we are taking next week off. So oh. there will be, not be a new episode next week. Sorry, but. I can't. I have something. She's got something going on, so she can't be here, unfortunately. Um, I guess we should introduce the show. Cause the show? Should, the, sh- the show that we're missing is oh. Two Girls, One Crossword. I'm Grace Tefenka. I'm Chelsea Rowan. This is your favorite weekly, occasionally not weekly, podword crosscast. Weekly-ish. Um, yeah, weekly-ish. We try our best, but this is like a, a passion project, you know? And mm-hmm. sometimes... Sometimes AKA just, free for us. Free <laughs> labor <laughs> for us to provide to you. Um, no, we, we like it. Promise. We like doing what we do. <laughs> we do, obviously. I mean, it's, we're on episode 158 now. Is, so 158 is wild. Yeah, if, you are, if you're a new listener, we might have some new listeners. Welcome to the show. Uh, we've been doing this since 2019, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, and we had to, obviously, with the pandemic, we had to figure out how to go to re- go remote. And so now we record remotely from each other. But we've been doing it for so long. I was looking up a past topic for this week, actually. I was looking up a past topic. And I was like, oh, I did this within the last year. But it was like episode 57 or something. And I was like, mm-hmm. wow, I absolutely had not done this in the last year because we're on episode 158 now. It was like mm-hmm. wild. Um Sometimes it's wild to look back and see where we started and where we are now. I think that we've covered like 300 different topics, and yet we find new ones every week. Yes. By the which grace means- of God. Sometimes By- I really feel like I'm not going to find one. <laughs> By the- God willing, we'll have a new topic every week. <laughs> um, but speaking of topics, shall I go over our poll of Palooza based yeah. on the viewer topic last week? Ooh. So. On Twitter, I asked our followers, which classic ice cream-based dessert are you ordering? <sighs> Banana split, which was Chelsea's topic, a sundae, a root beer float, or a milkshake? I was thinking of, like, diner, you know, or drugstore. Of course. Yeah, ice cream shop. Mm-hmm. And 45%, the winner, with 45% of the votes, was root beer float. 
what? which I love. You I know you wouldn't me. understand because you don't oh understand the, the intricacies of the root beer flavor. But um, in second place, 28% was a milkshake. So people like to drink their ice cream. That's what I'm learning here. I um, love a milkshake. There is a, in my hometown, there's an ice cream stand. I won't say what it's called, but it is like, it is, I dream about it. I dream about it because it's, first of all, it serves custard. So it's not hard like ice cream um, mm-hmm. it's custard which is made with eggs in addition to everything you would use just for regular ice cream it's amazing and they have a black and white milkshake there so black or not black um chocolate and vanilla ice cream mm. swirled together in a milkshake and you got to be careful about milkshake consistency and this place gets it right every goddamn time you know it's not too runny it's not too solid it is perfection I like a cookies and cream milkshake, poisonally. Um, Okay, 18%, third place was a sundae, a classic sundae. And then in last place with 9% was a banana split. So I guess people don't like banana splits. Banana splits are not about it last last week. I don't like bananas, so I don't want them near my dessert, okay? I certainly don't want them near my desserts either. I don't like fruit in my desserts. I feel like it is just... That's not what God intended when he decided mm-hmm. to give us desserts, okay? He dis- he was, like, up in heaven, like, oh, I want ice cream, but only chocolate. And he invented the sundae. And then some crazy guy from New York City decided to invent the banana split. He wasn't a banana actually from... In it. Yeah, he wasn't actually from New York City. He's from <laughs> Ithaca, whatever that means. Uh, <laughs> but, Yeah. Well, Sundays have cherries on top, which I also don't like. I always give my cherry away. Alex will take it. She can have it. She will take a cherry. I'll save my Um. cup just for her. (laughs) (laughs) Speaking of Sundays, I, because of the topic last week, I'd been dreaming of ordering ice cream. There's There's a great ice cream place near where Grace and I live. It's amazing. And they do custard, so it's amazing. Um, This is a different one than from the one that I grew up near whatever it doesn't matter i was like talking with matt i was like i really want ice cream should we order he was like do you want to order and we kept waffling back and forth but we made the adult decision to actually mm. go to the store and buy a carton of ice cream instead Ooh, so now what flavor I ice just vanilla okay. but i really like adding hot fudge and matt's gonna make brownies so it's, i'm gonna do like a brownie a la mode, Ooh, a la mode. Mm-hmm. maybe i'll come over <laughs> you should come on down <laughs> i do have to give you an extra set of keys i mean oh. we finally made copies of our full set to give you because we have like okay. 15 keys because we have 10 million doors to get to. yes maybe matt and i should actually bite the bullet and make our keys and give them to you because we've been meaning to welcome anyway. to our housekeeping podcast <laughs> shall we get into our heights and shites let's get into the heights and shites oh first i have a corrections corner well not really a corrections corner but i don't know if you remember a few weeks ago there was a clue in one of the puzzles and the answer was arch madness and you and i were discussing is arch madness different than march madness or is it the oh, same right. thing was it a typo and we asked our listeners who tend to like sports more than us what the GDH Which is not saying arch- much <laughs> yeah we have um, basically zero interest <laughs> it's true I asked, what does Arch Madness mean? And someone wrote to us and said, Arch Madness is the Missouri Valley Conference Championship tournament in St. Louis to determine the Missouri Valley Championship. The winner gets entry to the NCAA tournament, which is March Madness. Arch Madness is just a play on the name of the big tournament. And to that I say, Oh, because it's in St. Louis? Yeah. Oh, the St. Louis Arch. Uh, Oh, I thought it was just a, they took off the M because they didn't want to be sued. But I guess it makes sense because there's an arch there. All right, all right, all right. Yeah. I've actually caught up. I've got there. I'm here. Uh, and there Classic we go. Classic St. Louis. It's wild to me how passionate people get about college sports. And this is not, I'm not trying to like look down on people, but I'm like wondering imagine if we put the funding, the, the level of funding we do into college sports into like college arts programs. Imagine like the films or the radio shows or like the theater or like the art pieces, whether it's paintings or sculptures that would come out of colleges if we did that. Isn't that crazy to sure. think about? Yeah. Well, I feel like Shaquille O'Neal could direct an amazing film, but I don't think <laughs> Guillermo del Toro could play in the NBA. So it'll be that. Give him some time training and do do not put him in a corner (laughs) 
Anyway, um, uh, yes, yeah, so let's actually get into the hits and shits. I'll, I'll start just as there's one okay, small okay. thing. Um, the American Crossword Puzzle Tournament is this weekend. So by the time this episode is released on Monday of next week, it will have concluded and the winners will be out. And we'll talk ACPT? about the winners. Uh, the ACPT, which happens every year. I believe it's its 45th year. It's always held in Connecticut. Um, Stanford, usually, I believe, because um, it's close to NYC. It's hosted by Will Shorts, the New York Times editor. Um, a New York Times crossword puzzle editor, I should be clear. And the biggest celebrity in the cross world. Infamous. The biggest. He's also been in movies, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, so he literally is a star. Um, so yeah, uh, can, good luck. I mean, by the time this is out, my luck, wish to you, will not really mean much because it'll already be over. But well, just you're in putting case. the intention out into the world now, and that's what counts. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Maybe one of these days, Grace and I will travel to Stamford, Connecticut, and uh, at least spectate. Who knows? Yeah. Host. Grace is like, yeah, mm, nah, I don't know. <laughs> I, I just, not, I'm not good enough to be in these things. Like, no, I know. I'm going to go and round out the last place for these geniuses. <laughs> right. It's like, do we, <laughs> do they have like a spectator section? What about like a news, like a press box? You know, like we're technically like a, more like a press podcast than yes, we are uh, i would love to host or to be like you know in the dog shows knock 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 it's us well we'll see anyone reach out to us if you uh if you need our services thanks but go ahead that's that's all i got well not all i got but you know got it um i did the monday march 27th new york times by simon marat marat or marote and trenton lee stewart Three Down, Cold War Contest featuring Sputnik and Apollo, the space race, which we talked about in the moon landing episode. Mm -hmm. Um, Four Down, Sandwiches That May Save the Day, question mark. Heroes. Heroes. We call them hoagies in South Jersey. Um, And then 35 Across, TED Talk Accompaniment, often. Slideshow. I just like (laughs) the universe of TED Talks is so interesting to me yes have you ever it's, had somebody be like, like oh a... i have a ted talk that i uh you would like and they send you a ted talk and you're like what makes you think that i watch ted talks but okay <laughs> there's just like such a specific cadence and like vibe of a ted talk and i love seeing like people 100%. parody it because it's yeah. so it's just amazing yes um 67 across portable preparedness kit go bag go I'm bag like, i should make one mm. um that's it you should have yeah, a go bag in one. your trunk I have some car. stuff for the tr- for the trunk, yeah. yeah. In case I get caught in a snowstorm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, I did the Friday, March 24th, New Yorker by Rebecca Goldstein. I'll talk about the theme. The Friday New Yorkers are themed. 62 Across was the revealer. Simple pleasure. Or one way to describe 28, three, 28 Across, 3 Down, 7 Down, and 11 Down. And the answer was Creature Comfort. So I'll read you a couple of the themed answers. Three down. Transitory infatuation. Puppy love. Very cute. Cute. Creature comfort. Um, Seven down. Method for holding a newborn with skin-to-skin contact. Kangaroo care. Mmm. Eleven down. Analgesic ointment brand. Tiger bomb. So, you know, mm. creature and then comfort. Mm-hmm. Very good. Um, I also liked nine across. Question that might follow an unsuccessful punchline. Get it? <laughs> Which oh, is awful. Always yeah. Yeah. That's what I got from that puzzle. Very good. Well, I did the Sunday Washington Post by Evan Bernholz. Same. Called... Oh, you did? Excellent. Excellent. Um, it was called ID Numbers. Okay, there were some clues that I like. Nine across, blank miserable story of Jean Valjean, which is not that exciting. Only that Chelsea and I recently saw that, and then recently we did karaoke with a group of people, and we found out that a couple people from the group liked Les Mis, so we did like four <laughs> Les Mis songs. Like, it was so satisfying. Um, Les Mis songs are great to sing with the group, though, you know? Yeah. And now we're like, we need to go back and do like a full like Les Mis front to back exactly um i actually put that on my hits and shits as well and i wanted to bring up the exact same point that you brought up so thank you (laughs) excellent 
Um, a hundred down. Have someone live rent free in your head, say? And the answer was obsess. I just liked the he had live rent free in mm-hmm. clue. Ninety seven down, fall guy question mark. And the answer was Icarus. <gasps> Icarus. Oh, okay. Um Oh, Icarus. Never mind. I was thinking Ichabod. <laughs> No, 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 not Ichabod Crane. Icarus, you know, the guy who flew too close to the sun, a.k.a. Yes. Fall Guy. I was thinking Autumn then, Fall. <laughs> I liked 87 Across, conspiring after in, and it's cahoots. I just like that word. In cahoots. In-cahoots. The theme from That's this is fun. There. Um, so it took me a little bit to figure it out. Yes. First, before I get into the theme, I really liked 96 Across, unlike Cats and Dog in, quote, it's raining cats and dogs, end quote. Mm-hmm. Literal was the answer. Um, and then, okay, so then the theme was essentially there'd be these revealers like 101 Across, chemical formula for a liquid found in 23 Across. And the answer was H2O. So the letter H, the number two, and the letter O. If you're a crossword solver, you know that it is rare, very, very rare to see mm-hmm numericals in a grid it's usually only letters um but you know it's considered a rebus when you're putting multiple letters in a single square or numbers in a square so there is h2o it's like oh interesting they're putting num evan's putting numbers in the grid but this h2o answer is related to 23 across and the the clue for 23 across across is north hollywood spa in los angeles for example and the answer is bathhouse and so you're like what does bathhouse have to do with h2o well they're circled letters inside bathhouse both of the h's are circled and the singular o is circled so h2o so there's two h's and an o another example 121 down 1999 tech scare believed to present a major 110 across and the answer was y2k um, and then 110 across was danger to a computer network, and it was cybersecurity risk. There were two Ys and a single K in cybersecurity risk, so Y2K. Um, I swore you had done Y2K as a topic. I, I haven't. swore that you did. But I couldn't find it on the master list, so apparently not. I would, uh, Y2K would be a great topic to do. But Yeah, yeah good times good times but um so yeah the theme i thought the theme was going to be just like all like you know chemicals or chemical formulas yeah. when i but first saw wasn't. h2o i was like okay but yeah but seeing like y2k i was like oh okay 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 and there were many more uh along yeah, there's that ps3 theme. yes like the game the playstation 3 uh, but yeah that's what i had from that uh puzzle that was fun classic evan um, I did the Thursday, March 9th, New York. No. No, 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 no. Wait, why did I do that? Because that's not even... <laughs> uh, never mind. Okay. Um, I did the Wednesday, March 29th, New Yorker by Eric Agard. <laughs> Classic. Um, 22 across. Unconvincing response to, are you sure? I think so. Um, 41 across trade schools question mark transfer so like trade schools yes very good um 58 across shows that are not to be missed must see tv must see and then seven down shop that might have a pickle barrel which i believe you would enjoy deli, deli. Mm-hmm. i don't do not start talking about pickle barrels you don't have pickle barrels here in chicago what the hell is that about <laughs> yeah. sorry it's I mean, just chicago is great but it is does have some some issues it does and that is one of its major flaws like probably the, the most big flaw the biggest flaw i should say um 13 across instruction that might prompt swearing question mark promise me promise me promise me think of me fondly okay 35 across offensively bad performance question mark i was this tripped me up it's scoreless game like a game that you don't so your offense is bad so offensively bad it was so good that's also on my list and then 18 down like someone liking a 200 week old instagram post perhaps 
and the answer is thirsty. <laughs> I was going to think more like stalking because I feel like yes. that's usually the case. It's like an accident. You, you're you like going really far back. Then you like, that's the worst. It ha- It's happened to me once. Yeah, it's, yeah, you're like, oh, F. But it is something fun to do, like if some like someone that you actually know to like go way back and just like a bunch of old photos. I have mm-hmm. definitely done that to mm-hmm. people mm-hmm. just to be weird. Um, is that all you had from that puzzle? Yes. I also liked the opener, which was occasion to wear sleepwear to school. And the answer was pajama day. Such a good day. But you had to like curate the pajamas you were going to wear. At least I did. Anyway, every day was pajama day for me in senior year, at least. Oh, I uh, went to Catholic <laughs> school, so. Oh, right. That was a big deal for you. Mm-hmm. We only had, like, themed days like that uh, during Spirit Week. And we not every year we would get pajama days. Every year would be a theme. So one year was princesses. So it was, like, Cinderella versus, like, the seniors were Cinderella and the freshmen were Ariel. And, you know, so the themed mm. days were usually related to the theme of the, the Spirit Week. Whatever. Our, our school got really into Spirit Week. Bananas. But uh, when I was not in Catholic school, pajama day was a good was a good one. Mm-hmm. Um, I also liked. Well, this is just a shout out to one of Grace's older topics that she covered. Forty seven across consume more Nathan's famous hot dogs than than say, and the answer was out eat, um, which is related to Grace's topic where she covered competitive eating, which features Nathan's famous hot dogs in episode 70, Mysterious and Wet, which is a really great topic. You guys should check it Mm -hmm. out. That was fun. It's a good one. And then one of the champion hot dog eaters, one of our listeners literally like ran into him in Tokyo shortly after that episode came out and sent us a picture. It was amazing. I was like, what a small world. And he had a um, an iPhone hot dog. Yeah. yeah, his iPhone case was a hot dog because he's a competitive hot dog eater. Amazing. Um, yeah, it's like you think about how wide this world is, but then you're like, wow, this world is really small. Is that all you? Ha- Wait, that's all I had from that puzzle. So that's you- all I have in general. OK, I think I have one more. The Saturday, March 25th, New York Times by Robin Weintraub. I liked 13 across, quote, or don't dot 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 whatever works for you. End quote. That's how I read it. But then the answer was mm-hmm. no pressure, which made me think, or don't, whatever works for you, no pressure. You know, yeah. it was more of like an anxiety <laughs> thing. Um, 19 across is really good. This tripped me up. Midway point, question mark. The answer was gate. Like midway, mm. the airport. Very mm-hmm. good. 43 across. What an actor might do before the evening show. Matinee. Ooh. Tricky, right? Uh, 10 down. Response to a wild story. You did what? And then this is for all my New Jerseyans out there. I am born and raised from New Jersey. Uh, 26 down. Traffic sign near a jug handle, maybe. Jug handles being very much from New Jersey. And the answer is no left turn because you can't make a left turn. You can't make a left at a jug handle. No, no, no. You got to jug it up. You got to jug all the way around. Yep. That's, that, that is all that I have. That's it. I'm done. All right, then flip the coin if you're done. Okay, I'm flipping the coin since I'm done. I'm flipping the coin now. (gasps) It's heads. Mm. Back of my bullshit. I'm going first this week. Interesting. All right, all right. Interestingly enough, my topic appeared in two separate puzzles this week. So I'm going to be talking. I was like, the first time I saw it was like, oh, that's a maybe. And then that puzzle had a clue sort of related to that topic in it as well. And I was like, huh. Then I did a different puzzle and it had the same topic. I was like, it's fate. I must. I Mm -hmm. must do this. So the first time I saw it was in the Monday, March 27th, New York Times by Simon Moreau and Trenton Lee Stewart. Uh, And... Then I also saw it again in the Wednesday, March 28th, New York, New Yorker by Eric Agard. So, six, okay, I did both of those. Yes, 68 across. This is from the New York Times. Sandwich shop. And the answer was deli. Mm. And then also in that puzzle, four down, sandwiches that may save the day was heroes. And then in the Eric New, York, New Yorker puzzle was shop that might have a pickle barrel. And the answer was deli. <gasps> Oh, so, my God. I'm going to get so hungry after yeah, this episode. Yeah, I'm sorry. We're talking about delis. I couldn't not. I w- it was only a maybe, and then I saw it. 
I was again, I was like, all right, all right, twist my effing arm. I'll do it. Uh, you grew up in Miami. Did you yes. have delis there? Mm, no, we had the Publix deli. The Publix deli. So you didn't have like corner I mean, delis. I, they do have delis in Miami, I'm sure, but I don't know. Not that we ever went to because okay. we would get all that type of stuff at Publix. Okay, okay, okay. So a deli as Americans know it, uh, or a delicatessen, if you will, um, mm-hmm. is a store where people go to buy ready to eat items like cold cut meats, sliced cheeses, sandwiches, breads, salads, and much more. Delis are huge in Jersey, New York, Philly. I mm-hmm. spent most of my life in delis, um, whether that was Wawa at the Pickle Barrel or like local delis where my friends would work and they would make like hoagies and grinders and all sorts of things. And you get deli meats and just just a world of just beautiful food. Mm-hmm. So delis are close to my heart. Um, and... I'm really excited to talk about this, and I really want to go to a deli now. There are some delis in Chicago that I haven't been to that I'm like, oh, maybe this is my sign to actually go visit that deli finally. But anyway, back to delis. Okay. So the word deli or delicatessen is a German loan word from French and Italian, which then has its roots uh, being Latin, and it means giving pleasure, delightful, or pleasing which suggests that deli originate, like the word deli and delis themselves originate in Europe, specifically Germany. It said that the first ever delicatessen was a food company called Dalmar, or Dalmayer, based in Munich, founded sometime in the 1700s. This was the first store to import bananas, mangoes, and plums to the German population from faraway places like the Canary Islands um, or China. And it is still the largest delicatessen business in Europe. Mm. But here's the rub. <clears throat> in Europe, delicatessens typically only sell high-end, like, high-quality meats and cheeses and do not prepare foods and sandwiches. European delis are luxurious places to buy high-caliber, locally produced and imported ingredients. Remember, the word delicatessen essentially means pleasure, delight, pleasing, suggesting something luxurious. Mm-hmm. Uh, does that sound like an American no. deli to you? <laughs> no, not Sounds at all. Sounds very European. So in America, it's like, we need sandwiches. <laughs> we need sandwiches and a potato Pickle salad. Barrels. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so then how did the delicatessen from Europe become the delicatessen in the United States? The deli, if you will. We mostly call them delis. Between 1880 and 1920, more than two million Yiddish-speaking Jewish people from Eastern Europe came to settle in New York, which was already a heavily German city at the time. In 1890, New York City had more immigrants born in Germany than any other country. This wave of German immigration began in the 1840s and heavily impacted American culture. Think kindergartens, symphony orchestras, bilingual schools, the list goes on. These things we have because of German immigrants. These German immigrants also made, sold, and popularized and Americanized many foods. I'm going to read a list. Sausages, also known as Venas, Mm -hmm. beef frankfurters, sauerkraut, hamburgers, I didn't realize hamburgers were German, um, meatloaf, liverwurst, which I've never had but would try, many of the cold cuts that we know and love today, noodle dishes, dill pickles, God bless Mm -hmm. the Germans (laughs) for their dill pickles, Herring and cream cheese, lager beer, seltzer water, pretzels, also a Philly fave, soft pretzels, potato salad, monster cheese, rolls, such as the Kaiser roll, pastries, rye bread, and pumpernickel. I mean, dang, thank- that's like my diet. <laughs> yeah, thank God for that, right? It's all so good. Um, so these German immigrants uh, also established the American institution that sold most of these items, the delicatessen. In the late 1800s, German delicatessens were small, humble grocery stores. They sold canned foods, pickled meats, smoked fish, and food prepared on the premises. When more Jewish people began arriving in New York City in large numbers in the 1880s, they began opening their own delicatessens, a lot of them kosher establishments. At first, the early Jewish and usually kosher delicatessens differed little from the German ones except for the absence of dairy and pork. Instead, the Jewish delis had beef, Lots of beef. Think brisket, corned beef, pastrami, which is what I think when you think of like a Jewish deli, you think of 
mm-hmm. brisket, corned beef, pastrami, so on and so forth. <clears throat> and so the Germans started the delis, and then Jewish people arrived, started the Jewish deli, and started introducing different spins on some of the things that the German delis had already been offering. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the big reasons, other than Jewish delis needing to be kosher, was um, America had like a huge like cattle or like beef market or I don't know what you would industry. So it was mm-hmm. very easy to get beef versus other cuts of meat because we have these large prairies, large herds of cattle. The mm-hmm. beef industry was so big, which made these cuts of meat meat relatively inexpensive. So another reason why beef in delis became <clears throat> hugely popular. So Jewish delis start opening. In the first half of the 20th century, Jewish delis sprouted and spread across the United States. Almost always modest, these delis were often narrow storefronts with one counter along one side and then tables on the other side. Uh, An interesting note that came up multiple times in my research was that traditionally delis were not originally part of Jewish culture. Jewish families rarely ate out, not having the disposable income for buying luxury or specialty food. Uh, And there was the added fact that they couldn't completely trust whether something was kosher or not unless it was prepared by, like, another Jewish family. Mm -hmm. But Jewish delis in New York York City, especially the ones opening in New York City's theater district in the early 1900s, became part of the Jewish foodscape, due in part to affordability, but also they could trust the kosher label. Additionally. Mm -hmm. Ted Merwin, who is the author of Pastrami on Rye, an overstuffed history of the <laughs> Jewish deli, uh, which was released in 2015. <laughs> yeah. So this book was released in 2015, and so it might not be 100% accurate to now, but in his book published in 2015, he said that the 1920s is one of the most anti-Semitic decades in American history due to the growth of the KKK and the anti-Semitic newspapers, including the Dearborn Independent. Because mm-hmm. of this, Jewish people relied on delis as social spaces where they could safely exist. Merwin mm-hmm. calls delis, quote, cornerstones of the neighborhood where Jewish people met their spouses to talk to politics and, and developed strong cultural ties. Jews needed the kosher deli as a really important communal gathering space. I see the deli as on par with the synagogue during that era as a place for Jews to gather, end quote. Mm. And better food, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Uh, exactly. So that's why Jewish delis were hugely important. It reminded me a lot of um, the roller skating episode that I did with roller rinks being hugely popular in, like, black uh, neighborhoods and black culture. Mm -hmm. Um, But, yeah, I was like, oh, interesting. Okay. So according to the New York uh, Historical Society, there are an estimated 3,000 Jewish delis in New York in the 1930s. That's insane. But that number has since dwindled to just a few dozen as of 2022. What happened? So after World War II, Jewish people began moving to Miami and Los Angeles Mm -hmm. and to other areas of the country. They brought delis with them, of course, and the New York style deli became popular throughout the country in the 50s and the 60s. But unfortunately, by the 50s, uh, delis were already seeing a decline uh, due in part to the rise of suburbanization and Jewish people not living as closely together as they used to. Then in the 70s and 80s, American diet culture was rampant and a lot of people, Jewish people included, looked down on traditional deli food as cholesterol heavy and fat laden. So, diet culture runs diet. rampant. Seriously, and it ruins literally all the fun. So, yeah. also... Supermarket chains started incorporating deli counters into their stores, so combining suburbanization with this, and the question is raised, how many delis and butchers do we actually need, you know? Mm. Personally, I would say, you need one on every corner, because, you know, you're not going to have, like, your pu- a massive Publix every block, you know? You need a deli. I could walk to a deli and get a nice little bagel right now, I would. There is that deli the they claim to be, like, the Jewish deli of Chicago that's... On the north side, but not within walking distance. It's not in for either of us, you know? I yeah. Mean, it's close enough to drive, too, but... Yeah. Uh, there's if something... within walking distance, forget about it. Forget about it. Yeah. Okay. So, classic Jewish delis, the ones that are still around, are trying to make uh, the new food landscape work for them. Staying relevant and staying afloat during, like, you know, you know, suburbanization and all of this, but also during mm-hmm. the pandemic. 
Manny's Cafeteria and Delicatessen in Chicago, which is the one, the famous one in downtown Chicago that I've always wanted to go to and I haven't gone to, uh, they opened in 1942 and they're still around. They're still serving up classic sandwiches, hot entrees, and traditional seafood. But when the pandemic hit, the 300-seat restaurant went from 1,000 customers a day to just 50. No. Oh. Duh. I mean, I mean, it's not shocking to me that that happened, but it's sad. Yeah. So, but immediately after shutdown, the the owner, who is a fourth generation owner, pivoted to making long distance deliveries to the suburbs, working with third party like food delivery services, um, which allowed the deli to hold on to their staff and continue their 80 year tradition. Hmm. That's then, great. Yes, exactly. You want to go? <laughs> what are you yeah, doing in five minutes? Sure. Um, Call off work. <laughs> yeah, right? Sorry, we have to go to a deli today. Uh, okay, and then we've got uh, Schleisinger's in Philadelphia, the owner, Alan Dom. Uh, he's trying to pull in younger clientele by adding more vegetarian and vegan items and adding new dishes every six months or so. So retaining the classic deli feel and the historic ambiance, but a kind of giving his location like a revitalization to bring in new customers and allow for like different identities of people to identify with this establishment. It's not just like this old Jewish deli where you can get your, your pickled herring and whatever it is, you know, like Mm -hmm. we're also doing vegan Rubens and, you know, to kind of get the young folk in as well. So what about new delis? Mile End Deli in Brooklyn is one of New York's newest delis established in 2010, um, and it brings updated traditional Montreal-style deli cooking to a newer audience. The co-founder is Joel Titolman, uh, who is 40, and he's one of the youngest people to open a Jewish deli in the nation, and he thinks it's important to keep tradition alive for younger generations who might have less of a connection to Judaism. Uh, And then, uh, according to Ari Weinsweg, co-founder of Zingerman's Deli in Ann Arbor, which I've wanted to go to for so long. I follow them on Instagram and they look amazing, but I have no reason to go to Ann Arbor, but maybe one of these days. Um, so according to the this co-founder of that deli in Ann Arbor, quote, sometimes with tradition, a lot of moving forward is moving back. This goes back to milling our own grain. That's just the way it would have been done 150 years ago, making handmade cream cheese at the creamery, which is just how it was 100-something years ago. So there are new Jewish delis popping up, um, not just in New York, but there's a ton in L.A., a ton in Mm -hmm. Miami, a ton in Chicago popping up. Um, But they're few and far between. But, you know, hopefully we're going to start seeing a revitalization. They're trying to keep it traditional, but also, you know, revitalizing it. it yeah, exactly. this is like the exact premise of Lifetimes. They have one Hanukkah movie every year. And this last year, it was like two kids, their parents, like their family owned a deli and one was like very old school traditional. And then the other one was like trying to be more modern. And of course, they fall in love and it's around Hanukkah. But just I love that. <laughs> makes me laugh, yeah. uh, I'm going to end with like a couple of fun deli facts. The first deli in the United States was opened in 1880. Um, by a German immigrant named Sussman Volk. The deli was called Volk's Delicatessen, and it was located in New York City and was known for its cured meats and sausages. Mm. Uh, the famous Reuben sandwich was invented at Reuben's Delicatessen, uh, and Reuben's Delicatessen was located in New York City. They opened in 1909, but they sadly closed their doors in 2001. So the Reuben's creator was Arnold Reuben, the G- German Jewish owner of Reuben's Delicatessen. According to an interview with American restaurant critic Craig Claiborne, Arnold Rubin created the Rubin special around 1914. Then, in a 1953 book, uh, the book was called Broadway Heartbeat, Memoirs of a Past Agent. It states that the sandwich was a creation for silent film and later talkie actress Marjorie Rambeau, um, which essentially the actress went to Rubin's deli one night and the cupboards were particularly bare. And so Rubin, the owner, whipped her up a Rubin sandwich. That's a fun little story. Um, And then the oldest deli in the United States is Cat's Delicatessen in New York City, which is one of the most famous delis in the world. Again, a classic mainstay one I've been dying to go to. That's where there's that famous when Hallie met Sally scene where he (laughs) says, I'll have what she's having or whatever he says. Um, So it opened apparently, 
according to the cat legend. It opened in 1888 and it's still open today. But wow. some historians claim that the deli was not officially opened until 1910. So the place where Cats is located right now belonged to Morris and Hyman Iceland. What names, right? Yeah. They were brothers and they started a restaurant there. Then Willie Katz came to America in 1903 and joined the Iceland brothers in their business. Uh, a few other Jewish delis opened in the late 1800s and early 1900s, but most are now out of business. Katz, however, remains a staple in the Jewish deli business. So, yeah. And that's, that's what I got for well, delis. I am hungry. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I want like a nice big sandwich at 830 in the morning. Right. Uh, Who's to say you can't have a sandwich to start your day? Exactly. We had um, a we did a huge corned beef for St. Patrick's Day, and I remember a couple years ago looking into like why corned beef on St. Patrick's Day. First of all, it's American um, St. Patrick's Day tradition, and the reason mm -hmm. corned beef was so popular to um, Irish immigrants was because they could affordably get the corned beef at their local Jewish deli. So there's like an Irish Jewish connection. Um, with Ooh, delis and St. Patrick's Day. Yeah. So it's not like an Irish food. It's the Irish would buy the corned beef at a Jewish deli and because it was affordable and they had it there. And now it's a staple for St. Patrick's Day. So we're all connected in ways that you might not know. Just remember that, folks. Everyone is connected and we can all gather around a nice Reuben. Okay, my topic, I kind of messed up here. So I thought I was doing like... I don't know what what I was thinking here. Um, I ended up doing a crossword from March 9th, but it's from the <laughs> March 20th. Because the way the New Yorker does it, they have like the tide, the date up above and then they'll have from the March 20, 2023 issue. Yeah. I don't know what, what I was thinking. But anyways, it's by Caitlin Reed. I read did my top, topic on it, so I'm just going to go with it. Go with it. Um, 31 across, board game with a path through the peppermint forest in the lagoon of Lord Licorice. Candyland? Candyland, yes. I feel like we've covered different board games. Very Chelsea topic, but I'm excited <laughs> to talk about Candyland. Yay! I um, was talking with Matt the other day, and he had never played Candyland. Okay, well, and I'm going like, to talk about I actually talk about in my about? topic how, like, basically everyone has played Candyland, but I guess I was wrong. So, if you are like Matt and you've never played, <laughs> here's how it works. Um, players move down a winding track and the track has like different spaces on it. There are, it's each like little square is one of six different colors or it's marked by a special candy symbol. Players draw from a deck of cards that either show a color or one of those candy symbols. And then, uh, you move your token to that color and the token is a little gingerbread man. Um, the candy spaces can either send you on a shortcut through the path or can teleport you backwards on the trail. Mm -hmm. The first to reach the end of the track is the winner. And along the track, there's like, you know, the like molasses lagoon, lollipop fields. Like it's all obviously candy themed. Oh, I was, I loved the board. It was like the ambiance of it, the vibe. It was just, well, that is interesting because that's basically why it was invented so mm. i said here in my notes going over the game was probably unnecessary because most people born in the last 70 years have played candyland <laughs> as a kid <laughs> except oh. for matt but it was and still is extremely popular the game still sells 1 million copies a year why is it so popular well the board is fun and colorful the game itself is very simple there's very i mean there's no strategy involved at all one game can last like an hour or so and it's perfect for young kids kids can play it on their own mm -hmm. it's very easy to to learn mm -hmm. um and it's you know that makes it perfect for children who may be sick or stuck inside which is exactly what it was originally invented for during the polio epidemic so oh. i got most of my information from an article in the atlantic called candyland was invented for polio awards by alexander b joy so eleanor abbott she invented candyland she was a school teacher in san diego and very little is actually known about her because after she sold the game she kind of like i don't know went back to her normal life and mm. some people say that all the royalty she got from the game which i'm not sure how much but she donated it to children's charities or to like buying school supplies hmm. um in 1948 when abbott was in her late 30s she got polio and she recuperated in a san diego hospital along with a lot of children 
So a little bit about polio. Polio is a virus. Uh, <clears throat> it strikes suddenly and it seemed, you know, during the epidemic, it seemed to mostly affect kids under the age of five. Some people can get polio and you have no symptoms. Um, <clears throat> think you're more likely to have symptoms if you're a child. So it targets nerve cells in the spinal cord, which can lead to limited function of the legs. That's like the most common um, symptom of it. But it can also affect your neck, head, and diaphragm. If you have diaphragm issues, then that's when you would have to be in an iron lung, which is a machine that basically breathes for you. Some mm. people are in, it, are in iron lungs for years. Um, it. It's a horrible, horrible virus. Uh, the treatment of polio involves quarantining from others, physical therapy to stimulate muscle development, and eventually leg braces. A lot of times you can recover, but you might need to use leg braces. Mm-hmm. Um, vaccines appeared in the 1950s and the disease was basically eradicated by the end of the millennium. Wow. Vaccines. Yeah. Funny how that works. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> um, but while it was still raging, there was a lot of fear, mostly due to the fact that people like, or there was no known prevention and no cure and people weren't really sure how you were getting it. It is contagious, but it's mostly from like bad hygiene. Like it's spread through like fecal matter and stuff. So like little kids who don't wash their hands and you know. That's also why it affected kids and probably why um, Abbott got it because she was a school teacher. Mm -hmm. um, but <clears throat> at the time, like people weren't really sure. And if you if you were a kid and you didn't have polio, your parents kept you quarantined in the house. There's like stories of people being like, I broke through a window and my parents were so mad that I like exposed myself to the outside air. But they like didn't take me to a hospital because they didn't want to expose me to anything. Like it was, you know, very similar to mm -hmm. how things were here. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, basically, if you didn't have it, you were, like, quarantined at home. But if you did have it, then you would have to go to a polio recovery ward, and you could be there for months, you could be there for years. God. Um, so that's where Abbott was when she got polio. And obviously, she was a school teacher. She knew about kids. She knew what they liked. She knew how their brains worked. And now she was stuck in this recovery ward with a bunch of extremely bored, sick children who had nothing to do. So that's why she set out to invent the game. Okay. Samira Kawash, Kawash, a Rutgers University professor, says, quote, The point of Candyland is to pass the time. Certainly a virtue when one's days are spent in the boring confines of the hospital and an appealing feature as well of a, as well of a game used to pass the time indoors for children confined to the house. It's basically a time when children were, you know, stuck inside, basically. Um, but if you look at the early editions of the boards, and just even if you look at it today, it was more than just a way to pass the time. Hmm. It was like, explicitly related to polio recovery. So polio wards were extremely sterile and rigid. Only doctors and nurses were allowed in. They often had rows of beds or iron lungs lined up in straight lines. Children laying in iron lungs could only see what was on either side of their head, which was just other children laying in iron lungs. God. Sometimes kids would get a 15-minute break from the lung and they'd be able to sit on the bed, have a cup of tea, play Candyland, but then, you know, a guy was saying, like, what, my fingers would start turning blue again because, you know, your lungs aren't working that well. So then you'd have to go back into the iron lung. God damn. So in contrast to the uniform grid-like layout of a recovery ward, Candyland was bright and the road is winding. Even just tracing the path with your eyes could be stimulating. Like you were saying, the board is just so, like, um, you know, fun to look at. The, yeah. Like, the, the colors, the pictures, the journey through the, pa mm -hmm. the winding path. Um. And Candyland's play revolves around moving over the board. In fact, moving is all you can do in the game. So it served as a mobility fantasy mm. for kids. You know, in the game, kids were able to take leisurely strolls around the board, sometimes going forward, going back. This was in contrast to, you know, their actual physical activity, which was probably very like rigid physical therapy that they were doing. Um, and the original on the original board, there is a boy and a girl on it like there still is today mm -hmm. but um the boy has a leg brace ah yeah um the game encourages a feeling of independence and a sense of adventure instead of being confined to a hospital or home abbott eventually sold the game to milton bradley which was later bought by hasbro in 1984 um abbott presented them with a board game drawn on butcher paper they bought it they sold the first board in 1949 for one dollar Wow. But Candyland helped put Milton Bradley on the map as a game maker because at the time they were primarily known for making school supplies. Clue oh. had just been released but hadn't taken off yet. And if you want to learn more about Clue, you can listen to episode 70, Mysterious and Wet, where Chelsea talks about it, which is also <laughs> where we talk about hot dog eating. Um, I love it. 
Candyland was different because unlike most board games, children could play by themselves. After Hasbro bought Milton Bradley, they wanted to populate Candyland with named characters because up until then, it was just like the anonymous boy and girl on the board. There Mm -hmm. was no... Um, people. So in 1984, Hasbro contracted with Landmark Entertainment to create characters for the game, including King Candy, Lord Licorice, and Princess Lolly of the Lollipop Mm. Woods. But this contract with Landmark Entertainment is kind of why Candyland doesn't have any like, uh, like iterations, other iterations outside of a board game. So, I mean, you can get, they make like Spongebob versions and whatever, but like there's, there isn't a Candyland movie. In 2012, Adam Sandler was announced as being the star of a Candyland feature film, but Landmark Entertainment was like, Hasbro doesn't have the right to use those characters that we came up with. They can't license them to be used in a film. Hasbro was like, well, we just hired you as like a work for hire agreement. Obviously their contract is not very good, but to this day, the only adaptation of the game has been a 2005 direct-to-video animated feature, Candyland, The Great Lollipop Adventure. Interesting. So. And what's Landmark's uh, big deal? They just want money? Like Probably. Mm. Um, okay, and another fun fact. A company called Games Formation created an edible version of Candyland where the cards were made of chocolate and could be eaten after they were played. They also created edible versions of Battleship Scrabble and Monopoly. I feel like edible Candyland is more on theme, but oh my, guess yeah. that's, their, okay. that's their thing that they do. Um, and if you are Chelsea and I's age, you might want to know that some things have changed from the Candyland board that we played as kids. Okay. Some characters have changed um, in 2002. Okay. So if you remember Queen Frostine, mm-hmm. she was like up at the top. She's now Princess Frostine, which is like. Okay, McQueen Frostine rhymes. Yeah. Doesn't make any sense. Didn't we also already have a princess? She got changed. So Queen Frostine became Princess Frostine, and then Princess Lolly just became Lolly. She got oh. dethroned. Dethroned. Interesting. Uh huh. And then the molasses swamp is now the chocolate swamp. Okay. I can understand and... why they would change that. Yeah. And the character Plumpy was removed entirely. Sad. W- which one was Plumpy? I think he was, like, one of the first ones. I want to say he was chocolate-themed. Okay. Which is maybe why they removed him, because now there's the chocolate swamp. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Although the board has changed, you know, over time, the rules of the game are essentially the same. But now that the polio epidemic is in the past and <laughs> children don't have as many fears about losing mobility, the purpose and the escapism of the original Candyland doesn't really apply anymore. Sure. Um, and while it's still popular amongst young kids, eventually children realize that there's no way, there's no like strategy to win. The outcome of the game is decided once the deck is shuffled. Yeah. Unless you're like me and I used to play with my grandma and I used to know Queen Frostine's card had a little, you know, bend on the outside and I would try and put it like, you know, if I knew I was going first, I would put it on odds. And I thought I was being so sneaky, although I'm sure it was very obvious to her. Yeah. yeah. Now that I've played games with my niece and I've seen her try and cheat and think that she's getting away with it. <laughs> I love that, um, she, anyways, that she tries to, to pull fast on over on you and you're like, I've been there, done that, kid. <laughs> I just let him, like, I don't care. I'm like, yeah. I don't care about winning this game. I'm just trying to keep you occupied for like an hour. Exactly. Um, okay, so yeah, kids kind of realize, you know, there's no strategy to the game. The outcome of the, the deck just decides. So they might want to move on to something with a little more strategy. Mm. Um, I'm going to end with a quote from the Atlantic article about that. Okay. Quote, That, in the end, is what makes Candyland priceless. It is designed to be outgrown. Abbott's game originally taught children, immobilized and separated from family, to envision a world beyond the polio ward, where opportunities for growth and adventure could still materialize. Today, that lesson persists more broadly. The game teaches children that all arrangements have their alternatives. It's the start of learning how to imagine a better world than the one they inherited. As it has done for generations, Candyland continues to send young children on the first steps of that journey. Okay. Which... I don't know if I would go that far, but it is a sweet, um, you know, sweet to think about. Yes. Um, I love playing Candyland. And yeah, there's no luck. There's no strategy to it. But sometimes you're, as a child, I think sometimes, for me at least, I wasn't looking necessarily for a strategy game. Like, mm-hmm. there are plenty of strategy games that you can kind of learn early, like Uno or, mm-hmm. you know, whatever. But... um you just kind of like want to just let fate give you what it's going to give you, you know? Yeah, just go along with the story. I loved Candyland. Me too. Oh, God, I want to yeah. take a look at the board now. I know. I was looking at like some of the older boards too. 
and it's really cool to see like the artwork yeah the, years. the artwork is i just remember like being obsessed with like princess lolly and mm-hmm. king candy and the molasses one scared me i was like i don't want to be in there <laughs> <laughs> uh, amazing it's well funny. that's Candyland for you ah oh, love it we've done we've done a couple board games on the podcast um mm-hmm. or just games in general i kind of like that we have these like like clusters of information mm-hmm. around specific topics like board games we've talked about clue and monopoly and Candyland and like uno things like that like mm-hmm. um and we've got clusters of things elsewhere like we've got of our course. food topics as well true now i can't think of any i know that we do have like clusters of different things that we do right oh we do like different um like oh our what's it called like the yeti and loch ness monster what are those things called the crypt the yeah cryptids the cryptids, yes. There we go. Yeah. We've got cryptids, we've got food, we've got board games. We've got it all. We've got um, it all. So thanks for listening to us and we let will us know not your favorite. Oh, oh no, no, no. No, no, you... go, 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 go. You no, go, no, no. Go. Yours was definitely more no, on you... theme. Go, go, go. I was gonna say, let us know what your favorite board game is because you can talk to us on Twitter at the Good Evening. Ooh. No, at the Good Eve Girls. Yes. Um or um, let us know what your favorite deli sandwich is. You can talk to us uh, over on Instagram at the Good Evening Girls. And you can also find us on TikTok at the Good Eve Girls, where lately we've been posting little snippets of like just quick bits of trivia from our episodes, past yes. episodes. So if you've listened for a while, then it's probably not that interesting. But um, yeah, that's been kind of fun. It has been a lot of fun. And I hope uh, I hope the folks that if anybody's here from TikTok, thanks for uh, coming over. Um, we truly have so many topics we just like we said at the top of the episode we have at least 300 unique topics that we've covered through our time doing this podcast um and we're going to try and post as much as we can on tiktok to so that you can see what our catalog has to offer but if you're ever looking for anything specific um and you can't find it by reading our episode descriptions or episode titles just i know now i'm like us. should i go back and, and do that i don't know we'll see. no, no we'll, one's ever we'll, we always ask like do you want us to be putting the like what that topic actually is or do you want us to keep it mysterious and no one said anything no one said anything so i feel like let's stick to the formula for or... now but if you are looking for something specific just write to us on any of the channels we mentioned to you um and grace and i will try to figure out which episode it comes from <laughs> we have a topic master list we so. do we do have a topic master list that we need to update again but that's yeah. that's housekeeping that's for another day um but yes we will not be back next week but keep an eye on the week after because mm-hmm. we will be back and with more with more fun facts for those who like to keep curious, as we like to say. So uh, we hope to see you then. And yeah, we'll talk to you then. OK. And have happy Passover to anyone who celebrates. Oh, yes. Happy Passover. Shortly to after those. this episode. Yes. Um, all right. Have a good one, everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.